I'm Matt Dixon, and welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. The mission of Purple Patch is to empower and educate every human being to reach their athletic potential. Through the lens of athletic potential, you reach your human potential. The purpose of this podcast is to help time-starved people everywhere integrate sport into life. Now, you might know I'm getting a little bit long in the tooth, but I'm still ambitious. I still want to sharpen life, and I want to future-proof myself to ensure that I have the greatest quality of the life for the time that I'm around. Now, one of the tools that I leverage is Inside Tracker, because by taking a look inside, what I get to do is understand where I should place my focus in all aspects of performance so that I can show up performance ready daily, feel better, have greater energy and ultimately perform. I've got to keep up with the kiddies now, haven't I? The same could be said for Purple Patch athletes. A lot of the athletes that I help guide towards better performance utilize exactly the same service and you can too. It's very, very simple. All you need to do is head to insidetracker.com slash purplepatch. Now what they'll do is they'll assess your biometrics and combine the results of those biometrics assessment with the expertise of the team of scientists at Inside Tracker so that you get a personal action plan and you can prioritize where you're going to emphasize your focus and actions. It's very great. And also, on top of it, you're going to get some actionable results so you can track and see the measurable gains that you make in your performance. InsideTracker.com slash purplepatch and use this code while you're there, purplepatchpro20. That's going to get you 20% off everything at the store. Enjoy the show. And welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. As ever, your host, Matt Dixon. And today, well, I rub my hands in glee and anticipation. You might remember a few weeks ago that I talked about a special series that we were going to be doing around case studies of Purple Patch athletes. Some applied learning, if you will. In other words, hearing the stories and insights from athletes that are a part of the Purple Patch program and now how they've managed to leverage the methodology to facilitate performance in their life. Now, we kicked it off a couple of weeks ago with Mike Kane, an athlete that I coach. And what we learned with Mike is that he had a shift in perspective away from fitness, 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 and more towards health and habits. And it unlocked effectiveness, not just in his training, but also how he showed up as a leader. Today, we're going to welcome two Purple Patch athletes. Their names, Jeff Lipschultz and Marcel Lopez. They both have some powerful stories around how they've managed to leverage sport to help them show up in life and also shift in their perspective to get more results from the effort that they're putting in. In Jeff's story, you're going to hear about his arc from, well, a youth that wasn't full of sport, but actually how he has leveraged a journey and how he has really leaned into community in giving back to people to amplify all aspects of life. And Marcel has been an evolution in thinking and approach for him to yield results that he never thought were possible. It's a really compelling couple of stories. We're going to line them up back to back as a double meat and potatoes today. So it's going to be a lot of fun. But before we get going, well, let's do Matt's Newsings. Yes, folks, it is Matt's Newsings, and I want to tell you a little story. Just the other day, I was sitting with an athlete, and we were side-by-side at the computer, and we Googled something around nutrition as it related to triathlon performance. You know what came up? 15 different results with 15 different opinions. And when I looked at the source of the results, many of the people there brought a certain amount of credibility and expertise. No matter what information you're chasing, it is incredibly confusing and time-consuming. In a life that I'm sure, I imagine for you, is already plenty full of stress and, of course, competing demands. I imagine it must be so tough to know where you should place your focus, what to prioritize on, so that you can get the results that you want. Well, guess what? I've got pretty good expertise in much of these areas and a little bit of a reputation and proven results of unlocking performance in athletes just like you. 
including more than 1,500 time-staffed athletes who have qualified to world championship events. And so what we've developed is programming, support, education, specific to you, so that we can cut through the noise, so that we can filter the conflicting blizzard, blizzard of information. What we do is remove the complexity, reduce so much of the confusion, Simplify your training life without compromising your results. I don't believe in diluting or lowering expectations. Instead, I want to be your partner in unlocking effectiveness so that you can achieve your goals. It's very simple. All you need to do is reach out to us, info at purplepatchfitness.com. We'll set up a complimentary consultation so that we can understand your challenges and what your goals are. We'll then get you on program very quickly, within 24 hours, with absolutely no risk for you, because we're so confident, if you don't love it, after 30 days, we'll give you your money back. How does that sound? Info at purplepatchfitness.com. All right, with that, let's hear from the boys. It's Jeff and Marcel. We'll let Jeff take the stage first. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the meat and potatoes. All right, once again, is the meat and potatoes. And goodness me, I feel like this is long overdue. I finally get to welcome to the show Purple Patch Legend, the cruise director, as we call him, Jeff Lipschultz. Thank you very much for joining the Purple Patch podcast, Jeff. Well, thanks, Coach. Uh, I don't know about legend, but uh, cruise director, yeah, I've, I've been a part of Purple Patch for quite a while and have met a lot of great people by, by being involved with our community. Absolutely. Got, somehow got that little moniker, maybe self-proclaimed, who knows? Who knows? But uh, but it's a uh, it's great one. It's well learned, and we're going to dig into that a little bit later. Um, the uh, the special show that we are series of shows that we're actually doing is sort of digging under the hood of the of uh, of Purple Patch and getting to know some of the athletes and their journey. And I think your journey is is one that a lot of people will be actually both inspired by, but also I think hopefully by the end of this conversation, maybe shift their their mindset and their perception of what sport can do for them and uh, and maybe how to get the most out of their sport. And uh, and I'm going to not dig into that too much now. I'm going to allow our conversation to hopefully unearth that. But to get us going, as I always like to do, I'd like to know people's background, where they originate from, family, uh, situation, et cetera. So just just kick us off. Give us a little bit of the, the Jeff Lipshaw profile, if you want to call it that. Yeah, you love to call me a Texan, Matt, but I am originally from Chicago. Um, Grew up there for quite a while, and a sport was not a part of my life at all. I learned how to ride a bike at 10 years old, long story short. And uh, sport wasn't a big part of my life. I don't think I was sedentary. We, we went out and did stuff as kids and all that. But I really didn't discover sports until uh, I had gained about four sizes on my belt when I started working uh, out of college and realized I was on a, on a road to uh, – I don't know, potentially obesity. And uh, my father had passed away at an early age, uh, relatively speaking, has never met his granddaughters. And I uh, vowed that I was going to do everything I could to meet my grandchildren someday if I had those. And uh, so I, I embraced cycling uh, at around 2002. And then and then uh, triathlon came into my life around 2014. So uh, took a long time to get here, but I'm glad I did. And you're... Um... Uh, before we dig into the sports, I want to get I want to get there. But um, what do you do professionally? I always think it's important to understand sort of uh, what people do on a professional sense. I grew up an engineer, but uh, through through a lot of different t- twists and turns of a career, I, I I'm now a, a senior director of HR uh, for a technology company out of Palo Alto, uh, one that actually is familiar to you, and. Um, yeah, and, and and so it's 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 funny to be an engineer in that role because you're you're trying to engineer things all the time. But uh, it's, it's yeah. wonderful to work with people. Yeah, f- f- fantastic. And there, there's there's a story there, but we won't go into it uh, today. We want to talk about Jeff yourself. But um, sports growing up, so so not your you you, you weren't one of these puppies that was here, there, and everywhere with sports. And um, and, and I'm always interested. You, you talked about getting into bicycles first. Great. That, that's your strength. You did not grow up swimming either, yes? You're a, you're a classic adult onset swimmer. 
I, I, I like to think of myself as even beyond that. I didn't even know how to swim. I, there was a lesson, and back in 14, someone told me about a lesson at the rec center near me, and uh, they said, you should really take a lesson and, and try this. So on Halloween of 2014, I, I went to the gym, swam across the pool, and said, okay, now I know I won't drown when I go to my lesson on Monday. Wow. Okay. I mean, I really didn't know how to swim. I mean, it, and, and, and I was actually, I don't know that I was afraid of water or anything. It just didn't interest me at all. My parents, I think, tried to get me into swimming lessons. It didn't take. So I uh, didn't know how to swim. And I'm flat-footed, bow-legged. So I tried running when I got out of uh, college with a friend. And I got shin splints like the first week. So it was a disaster. So I was like, running's not for me. But at the same time I was trying the swimming thing, my brother-in-law said, hey, come do a turkey trot when you visit uh, over Thanksgiving. I'm like, okay, I'll try. Bought a pair of shoes, ran for a month, and and went and did a turkey trot. And that's how my triathlon career started, is taking on two sports that I had no idea what I was doing. And and uh, I guess the, the one thing that you had in confidence was cycling. Yeah, you'd done cycling tours and things like that, yeah? So um, did you ever race bikes, per se, or was it more just a passion of riding and, and exploring sort of thing? Well, you know what they call two guys riding a bike in Dallas, right? <laughs> no, come on then. a race a race <laughs> but, okay. so, yeah so i never raced like uh like you you're you're, you're alluding to but um yeah I've, I've been riding for since 2002 and we've ridden i, I rode across the country with trek travel uh in 2000 something or other 10 and we did we did uh the pyrenees my buddies and i in 13 and and we've done you know mount evans and all the fun stuff in colorado so i mean i've done a lot of different stuff on a on a bike uh, including going to what I call t-shirt rides. And yeah, you go to the front of a t-shirt ride, it's a race. Of course. So, I mean, you, yeah, hanging on the back of uh, some team, all matching jerseys and being able to finish with them, that's like an accomplishment in Dallas, right? So um, it, it uh, cycling has definitely evolved for me over time. But even with all that in, in 14 and that story I was describing, um, it was like cycling was getting boring. How do I make cycling more interesting? And adding two sports to it actually was the answer. It was kind of bizarre, but it worked out that way. And, and two sports, I think a lot of people underappreciate this about the sport of triathlon, so multiple disciplines, is that, you know, your story is almost the classic triathlon story because I, I, I very seldom, unless you have someone that comes out of a true multi-sport background, that doesn't enter the sport with a very clear weakness. And as, as human or beings, two. we don't, or, or two in your case, yeah. But but we, as humans, we don't tend to, or many of us don't take on a challenge, in which we're genuinely not very good at it to begin. So not too many people start from scratch when they make it up thirty five years of age and say, "I'm going to learn skiing now." It's just like I don't ski. I'm not a skier. Triathlon is really interesting because it exposes in you. You can bring like a good strength. Cycling. The other thing that many triathletes don't have and, and you don't have not going through sports as a as a youngster is you haven't developed the mindset the athletic mindset um you actually ironically because i believe it's a performance mindset that you've developed in other areas of your life professionally obviously but you haven't gone through the experiences that may be like very different than sort of me growing up where I grew up a swimmer I was an elite swimmer and I went all the way because so I'm swimming college and then I go to triathlon so I had a toolbox of how what training is like how to manage fatigue what's good fatigue what's bad fatigue what's normal pain what's abnormal pain all of these things how to step up you, you don't have that so you're very youthful in your triathlon career. I know it's 10 years, but um, you're pretty youthful. And yet here we are. And in fact, I, it was one of my my favorite competitors in 2021 was in St. George when you qualified, went to the 70.3 World Championships. I know that was a, a bigger thing, but you've done multiple Ironman races as well by now. Um, how, how many half Ironman distance races have you done? You've done a lot of I've done, I think, 12 halves, five fulls. Yeah. And, you know, and a smattering of other other little littler ones. You bring up an interesting point about the training side of things, Matt, because that that was what was missing. Even even if you're if you've been cycling for all these years, you just kind of learn. By osmosis, you learn from your friends, right? That's a beautiful community that cycling has is you can learn how to ride a bike with your friends. But 
when I started learning how to run, I had um, I had ITBS by I don't know six months by my first race by my first half. I did Austin with ITBS. It was very painful because I didn't I didn't have classical training. I didn't I didn't have the the knowledge that goes with hey guess what you need hip and glute strength and you're overstriding. You're an idiot. You don't know how to run, you know? So, so having coaching, I, I was with another club locally and then I found purple patch and it's like learning all of the ins and outs of the sport, all the details, the details matter, the details. matter, And, and that what, that's what uh, propelled me forward in, in those two sports from, you know, this youthful, you say uh, in the 10 years, there's a lot to learn. It really is. It, it really is, and and it and you can't rush a lot of it. You have to learn a lot of it, you know, gradually over time. That's why we we talk about embrace the journey so much. So I, you know, that was you just highlighted one. My next question was going to be in your early years, what were what were the biggest challenges that you faced? You just highlighted one, which was a pretty instant injury when you got cracking. Running based injuries very very common. What other challenges did you have? When you reflect on your on your sort of training journey, it's always interesting to unpack those. Well, for, I mean, you don't know what you don't know, as they like to say, right? So when it came to swimming, you know, a key a key issue there was just thinking you could power through and go fast. You know, so swimming again, I know it comes down to form again, just like we were talking about with running, but but it's 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 literally thinking when you're a cyclist. I have the engine. I mean, that's how I got injured, right? I have the engine. I can run fast, but I will blow the car up because all the parts are not ready to go that fast. And swimming was the same way. You're, you're just plowing through the water, not even rotating, not even the simplest thing. And, and so with coaching, suddenly it's like, yeah, Jeff, this is how you swim, right? Not like this. And, and, and this is how the the hand enters the water. I, I think my biggest challenge up front was just, not even knowing what I don't know. I, and then they also, of course, you know, not uh, going at it alone initially was, was, I think a lot of us do that. Let's just see if this takes, let's see if I'm going to even enjoy doing this. And then you realize pretty quickly that without some formal coaching of some kind, wh- whatever it might, you know, might take, uh, without any coaching, you are going to make so many mistakes that um, could be easily fixed quickly you know, yes, it takes time. Like you said, I've learned all this over a course of time, but um, it definitely can lower the risk of getting hurt, lower the, you know, increase your ability to, to learn and, and maybe not get frustrated too. There were times with swimming that I was like, you know what, this is not working. This yeah. is, I, I'm, I'm not a swimmer. I, I, this is not working. Maybe I can do some kind of run bike thing or something. Um, and I tried everything. I won't bore you with those details, but it, it also can get so frustrating you want to quit. So I think I think with proper coaching and a proper community around you, um, that that allows you to overcome some of those challenges that we're talking about. That happened to a lot of us early on in in, in the sport. Yeah, I, I mean, so I love talking to you because I can't help but go on tangents. But coaching is is interesting because I, you know, I'm a coach, so I'm going to value. I'm going to stand up on the soapbox and say coaching is really valuable. <laughs> you know, it's important. But um, but I think one one of the things that um, if I reflect on my journey as an athlete, I was an incredibly loyal athlete. So I sort of all, all, almost parental, looking at my probably parental through my lens. I just wanted to please my coaches, but that didn't make me a really good coached athlete because. I was almost, I would just run through barn doors. So I didn't have any autonomy. But it's very, very difficult, whether you're coached or otherwise, when you're doing the doing to emerge from the weeds. And and I think the coach, a coach, a qualifier, some form of coach, enabling perspective, giving you guidance, helping you course correct, enabling you to pull back, that's the valuable stuff. And I think there's often people misunderstand coaching the why I t- why I talked about sort of some of my failures as a coached athlete was that I always viewed the coach as the person that was just going to deliver the magic program that would unlock everything yeah versus a really fruitful coaching relationship in anything where it's like actually I'm still doing the doing I'm still in control of my program this person has got the wisdom the perspective the expertise to help me get the most out of my efforts and, be- and make smart decisions it's really right. different than just unlocking these key workouts but 
anyway, but, but back to the discussion at hand, but, uh, but find that uh, very, very interesting. I, I, I do want to say in, uh, before, I do want to ask something around your riding because you came from a riding background, but one of the things you said to me before we came onto the show to actually record it was, I thought I knew it all when it came to bike riding. And so you were doing enough <laughs> riding, yeah. but not not with a form and, and not what we call at Purple Patch strength endurance work, which is low cadence work at high torque. Right. Um, can you just unpack that a little bit for me? What you meant by that? Because I, I never asked. Yeah, you know it's easy. It's easy when when you're hanging with those guys in, in Dallas at the back of that little peloton there, or sometimes the front. They play games, right? Um, that you've got it figured out. It's easy to build that much confidence because you're a strong cyclist, but then you, over time, you learn. Listen, there's something to be gained from doing, you know, different kinds of workouts indoors, strength endurance work, low cadence. I didn't do low cadence until I met you. Never, hmm. never, ever, ever. I mean, I did intervals when it was hip, when it was the thing to do, right? Yeah. Intervals have been around for a while. It's not a new thing. And that's I would put the video. I want to say the VHS tape, but I mean, I think it was at least a DVD. Um, I would put it in and do the intervals. I would be loyal. Like you said, I would just do the work, do the work and whatever. But it, it, uh, you figure out, depending on your coaches, that there's more to cycling than just doing the work. Yes. You have to, you have to realize there's, um, there's, there's a skill set. And I'll tell you to this day, I'll admit it in front of everybody. I'm still not perfect in my pedal stroke and and i'll be doing my my workouts with purple patch and with my buddies i still ride with the same purple patch folks um that i have since 2019 since we started riding together uh and we'll be hey pull up on the backside come on you know we're loosen that you know loosen up you know get the shoulders loose and all these things it's like i'm sure i wasn't doing any of those things when i was riding before being yeah, coached yeah no, no so so it's easy, it's easy to be lulled into that uh, confidence that you're doing it right enough. Maybe it's not that you're doing it right. You're doing it right enough to, to, to do well. And it's like, but you could be doing better. And here's the thing, Matt, when you're a cyclist only, at the end of that hard t-shirt ride, you get a beer. You don't go run a marathon, right? So, so it's also easy to say I'm doing it well enough because I'm done. And and if if I have to go run a marathon, I remember Wisconsin, my my uh, the full of there, my legs were locked because those hills they're they're badass, you know. So um, I I had I had locked quads for an entire marathon. I obviously didn't bike it correctly. So I mean, there's that was before Purple Patch, um, but it it, it definitely um, I think confidence you can be overconfident. When you're coming into a, two sports like that, oh, I want to sports. do a I want to do a slight detour here. Not going too far down the rabbit hole because we're going to come back to community a little bit later in our conversation. But you mentioned riding with the same group since 2019, so for the last five years or so. Now you're based in Dallas. Uh, most people spring to okay. You're based in Dallas. Maybe there's a hub of you in Dallas. So so this cast of crew. Just give me a couple of the cities or a few of the cities where these folks are based that you're riding with on video every single week where, where are they all based you and da- you're in, you're in dallas i'm in dallas but we i ride with portland i ride with victoria or, or uh calgary i ride with uh michigan and idaho and uh Mich- and another michigan a couple of michigans uh and 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 what's funny is here's the funny story i went to do um waco 70.3 and i learned that there's a purple patch athlete competing there. I meet him at the race and he lives five minutes from me. Had never met him before. I'm riding with people all over the country and here it is. And now I ride with Joe on, on, on Saturdays. Occasionally he rides with my posse now, but I mean, it was so bizarre, but yeah, I've been riding with those folks since, and and a few others, uh, since 2019, right before COVID. So, I mean, it was, wow, a godsend. Uh, as you know, I kind of, built a community of riders to ride with uh, on Tuesday and Thursday mornings because we do our own thing uh, before work. And uh, I'll tell you, we have said many a time that, oh, thank goodness I did this one with my friends and not waited till after work and did it by myself. Solo. 
makes a big difference. And these people are genuinely your friends now. It's fantastic that you, you know, like connected through a common passion, but in, in all different levels. And, and just for listeners, you know, so that, that, that they can understand, you're, you're obviously different time zone from here in San Francisco, Tuesday, Thursday, West Coast, and people with more flexible schedules. I'm then coaching live. I've got my group in the center in San Francisco, and I've got people all over the world. And, and it's funny, we go to a training camp and someone will come in, Anna from, from my little group, and I, I, I meet her for the first time a year or so ago. And she's like, hi, how's it going? Because we already know each other really well because you're part of this connect community. Yeah. Um, we, we will come back to the importance of that and your journey, but I, I want to uh, keep it narrowly focused on you first and, um, and talk about uh, now uh, who's counting, but I think you've been for – with Purple Patch for six years now, something like that, five or six years. Yeah, something like that. Lots so, something like, so, so, so I want to go back of of some of the shifts that have occurred, and and I'm not asking this, you know, Purple Patch, Purple Patch, Purple Patch. I'm, I'm, there's been an evolution in your performance. Some of it is that the maturation curve of just becoming a smarter athlete. Some of it is you're genuinely coached now, and we talked about the value of that. What are some of the elements that maybe you can highlight that you feel as an athlete have been most important for you? And, you know, whether it's training, whether it's habits, whether it's mindset, whether it's strategies, you know, integrating walk breaks that we love to do, um, the educational side, what, what are some of the aspects that you think have been most impactful for you? Some of the changes that you've made over the last years? Well, an easy one that comes to mind, and it's, it's a broken record for a lot of people and they don't want to hear it as strength strength mm-hmm. workouts. I've been Mike, I've been working out with Mike, you know, on, on my little computer here on, on, uh, I move it to Mondays and, and Thursday or Fridays and get that done. Just get it done. Yeah. It, it, and, and I learned a hard lesson when I got ITBS that stays with you forever. It's like, you didn't, it's not something you want to get again. And it's all about hip, uh, hip and glute strength and all that. And, and I did the PT. So I'm like, and actually, that's when I discovered the podcast, Secret Secrets Out. I would listen to you while doing my PT. That's and that's when I joined Purple Patch, right? You know, soon. Oh, after. interesting. Yeah. So kind of funny that you were in my ears long, a long time ago, even when I was injured. But strength critical um, to avoiding injury, yes. But being a, a stronger cyclist, a stronger swimmer, core strength. Uh, so that was one of the key things that Purple Patch uh, gave me. Um, but again, I, I'll never forget when you had Sarah pregnant and everything on a treadmill and you're doing, here are the five things you need to do to be a good runner. She was doing it pregnant. If she could do it pregnant on a treadmill, I think I can learn it and figure it out on, on my, on my journey. And so, um, just simplifying maybe how to be good at these other two sports was critical for me. So mm-hmm. it was, it's not just that you're talking about how to do it. You're showing us how to do it. And then yeah. you, of course, with the sibling, with on the videos that we do, the live classes you do, you getting off the bike and talking through things, things to think about, things to do when you're on the bike. The the visual part is, I think, the one of the big big winner big wins for Purple Patch over the last couple of years is that people can see what they're supposed to be doing, yeah. not just hear you coach us on it. Um, so nutrition's been big. You, you I, I've listened to you know all the podcasts, obviously, and um, you've talked about nutrition a lot of different ways, and had guests talk about nutrition, and it does. Um, give us a mindset on how important that is. So, and, and of course, you know, recovery, rest, and all that kind of thing. Being all, smart about it. all the stuff that is non-negotiable. If you're purple patch, it's uh, it's funny. You you smiled uh, for folks that listen. You you smiled as you said that, as, uh, because it's just such a part of the fabric of the program. Uh, so, so I want to ask you that. Um, you have, I mean, you're very busy. You're uh, you got a demanding role in life. How is the sport, the journey of sport? Do, do you feel, because I, I talk about this, of the value of sport and it's it's great and you achieve and you, you've been to the world championships, et cetera. What's the impact been on you as a human being, you as, a, you as an executive? Well, uh, one could argue I'm a pretty goal-centered kind of person. Yeah, one might argue if, that. If you, know me, if you know me at all, you know I'm a goal-centered kind of person. And and, and that's in, in my career and 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 it has been also in sport. But defining those goals carefully, I think, is really important. And um for me when it when it's come down to it with, with triathlon, 
it's it's not just going to a world championship and all that. It's also, I think for me, the role of sport in my life has just been able to give back within the sport, you know, to to take but also to give. There's a, there's a wonderful, amazing community within triathlon cycling too, um, where you you make you you do make friendships for life, and you and you do you you are able to help people. Um, through their journey and things of that nature. So for me, the role of sport in my life has been, I hate to, I don't want to identify myself as a triathlete, but it's a part of who I am. Yep. It's a part of my DNA now. You know, I can't imagine life without being a triathlete. It'd be weird. Um, and and so it's, it that's that's part of it. But going back to the goals and everything else, I like to challenge myself. I, I, I like to push myself and and it might not be that I'm going to be on a podium that at that race, because I'm going to California and there's going to be a hundred people that are vying for that podium. They're all, I mean, they're, they're loaded with talent over there, you know, for, for a race like that. So what, what is your goal? If you're going, going up against them, your goal is to try and break five ten or five or break whatever, or have yeah. the best run of your, of your life, you know, so things like that. You can, you can definitely still challenge yourself with, with unique and creative goals within the sport so many that you could come up with um and then of course the role you know i I think you alluded to it you know community um we can talk about it in a minute but um for me it's 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 also just who i identify with to a certain degree and 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 being able to um i mean you were talking about these folks that i ride with on on tuesdays and thursdays some people cherry pick their races because they want to win that race I pick my races based on who's going or who I can go with. The people that I ride with on weekdays, I've gone and, and raced with them in Hawaii, raced with them in Victoria, right? And 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 had that experience of meeting them in person, like you were talking about. Uh, you know, it, it it's to me that's that's like it adds another dimension to why we do this. If, if I couldn't do it alone, if it, I couldn't imagine just I'm just going to be a triathlete and do it this way. I mean, I've gotten people to go do an Ironman for the first time. I've got a guy that I pseudo coach. He's almost 80 years old and we're just trying to get him to 80. He's done a million sprints and, and, and some smaller uh, distance races and he's getting up there in age. I mean, we really have to keep band-aids on him. Um, but, but to see him achieve that goal, but even at the other end of the spectrum, uh, not eighties, but five years old, six years old. I, I've coached 230 kids on how to ride, how to learn to ride without training wheels. Fantastic. Do you remember you, you, you taught Baxter how to ride a bike? Yes. Yep. Yep. I did. Yeah. You remember, you remember that moment and how it felt in your heart? Do you remember, you remember how yeah. it felt when you, when he, when he was riding? Yeah. Yeah. That feeling that you had, I've got the chance to experience it 230 times over the last 15 years over and over again, it's always the same feeling that child taking off on a bike. That's that feeling right there. That's what triathlon, that's what it feels like. It's the best way I can describe what the sport means to me is that, that little feeling in your heart when you're like being with your buddies and and racing or, or just walking the course together, whatever it is, it's so fun. You know, you know, that feeling that you felt there, that's the sort of feeling that, I feel when you qualify to the world championships oh, and uh, you've got a lot of athletes, it's uh, that, yeah. that's, that's, that's what coaching is. It's great. And um, I, I, let, let's go down the rabbit hole of um, uh, open up community because community is a funny word to me as a part of purple patch. We got a large group of athletes. We got, it's international. And when you say community, it, it, it's um, it can mean a lot of different things to different people. And it, 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 like anything, you've got core people that are wholly invested and you've got the, the voyeurs and the people that I don't need it. I consistently see in any arena that anyone going on an individual journey, whenever you shift towards team or squad or leaning in, individuals do better because it starts to drive a performance culture and there's a whole bunch of reasons for it. Your nickname is the cruise director. And the reason you've done that is 
just as it emerged out of uh, something that I didn't know about you teaching all those kids to, to ride a bike, you are giving, giving, giving in so many ways, hosting the ride that we've talked about already, um, really active on our uh, community boards, helping people, uh, almost having a coaching role in that really organic, suitable way of providing advice and counseling, um, connecting people. Uh, geographically. There's so many cases that we could go on for for five or 10 minutes just talking about everything that you do. So you're giving. And I want to ask a question because uh, in my thesis, by you giving that much, you're getting a lot there as well, aren't you? Are you getting a lot out of that as well? Like, what do you get out of that? I, I mean, I genuinely like to help people. But when you receive the help from them to start with, you receive, you, you can't coach us 24 seven. You can't be there for us all the time. You're great, but you can't be there. So who's going to pick up the pieces when you're not there? Who's going to tell Jeff, you know, it's 41 degrees outside. I have to go do a brick. So I have to go from sweaty bike to, to putting on the right clothes to go outside. You know, it's always a pain in the butt, you know, and Bob will say, well, throw on, throw on a tech tee and then throw on your, your, your heavier shirt. Oh, okay. I mean, sorry, coach. You never told me that. I wouldn't yeah. expect you to, you know, but <laughs> it's like all these little things that your community can teach you can teach me. Right. I've, I, I have been the benefactor of this for a long time. Even when it was just cycling, I had to learn from my friends how to, how to cycle better, you know, and you take and take and take. Um, it's nice to give because you know that they're going to appreciate what you're sharing with them or what you're doing for them. Or, or, you know, when we went through COVID, Matt, it, it was, oh my goodness, I mean, man. yeah, we went through that. Together. Yeah. So I was, I was messaging individuals, you know, how's it going? You know, especially ones I knew weren't, you know, come join our ride or things like that. One of, one of our athletes lost their, their uh, father-in-law. So it was like, follow up with him, you know, just the little things that people know you care because it makes such a difference for them. So it, it bring it just makes me feel good. I, I guess I'm a little bit spoiled. I mean, it, it feels good to help people. And, and we've got so many athletes with so many unique stories and, and, uh, and I've learned from a lot of them. So I, I feel I owe, I owe the community something to give it back. You know, I guess it's that simple for me. Yeah. I think, I think the lesson is because, uh, I don't think that there, there are many people that don't appreciate the power of leaning into team, community, squad, et cetera, and, and really helping others and the, the benefits that you will get. But it, it, it's a, an individual sport in which you, you one earns the rewards from it, but uh, and, and it's with training, hard work, commitment, smart decision-making, the supporting habits, recovery, nutrition. But the, the edge, the X factor, the amplifier universally is when I see people lean in, they get more out of the journey. They get greater rewards. And, and I think that that extends to it, you know, sport not being the thing that you mentioned it earlier, but defines you and the results not define you, but it sure helps you become a better person. And I think that's that's just, and show up better in other areas of life. And, uh, and I think a key a key to unlocking that is community and sharing and being a part of it and helping others, mentoring others. You get so much more of a, re a reward for it. And and I think, yeah, the, the beacon of purple patch for that. That's I mean, honestly why, the biggest reason I wanted to, to talk to you about it. Um, let, let me ask you one more question. Um, and, um, and this is, as you sit now and you're, you're sort of a decade plus into your journey, and this year opportunity is what would you, if you wanted to leave the show and extend your wisdom with one or two lessons or takeaways to say, everyone listening to this show, appreciate this or th take this perspective, take this mindset, what would be the one or two takeaways that you, Jeff, would, would share with, uh, with listeners? Wow. Um, but one of them we kind of talked about just the, this and we, we glossed over it. So we'll hit it again. Details matter, right? In, in this sport, the littlest change 
that you can make to the, to your to your gait to your to your swim form to to how you ride the bike whatever it is those those little details will eventually pay dividends and i used to be that guy who'd be like oh that's such a small thing it's not going to what that's not going to make it that's not going to get me to here you know it's such a small thing but our our sport is very repetitive we do that same small thing a thousand two thousand you know thousands of times right so it does add up so those little details matter so when you when you preach the different types of things we can do um and sometimes it gets repetitive and we were like enough already but it's like i need that reminding right so those details those details are really really important to to me i i think i think the other thing i learned and i started learning this um a little bit before purple patch um it was funny i asked a a coach on on our on our previous team how long do you think it'll be before i can qualify i mean i was i wasn't dead serious about it but i was like how long? oh he's like well jeff you've just kind of started it's going to be a couple years and i'm like a couple years <laughs> what yeah. i mean i thought we were going to be in months not not year i mean i have to do this for a couple years before i get dividends from and and you know now all these years later you realize that uh, the other gem i would share is just patience is paramount right you 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 can't invent yourself i mean you didn't invent yourself in a, in a year it was an evolution that got you to where you are today or any athlete we look mm -hmm. at or any or any professional executive whatever it is even as a parent we we don't start out knowing anything and we and we evolve and learn so um you have to be patient with that process. You have to be willing to make the mistakes, learn from the mistakes, ask questions, realize you don't know everything. Um, again, lean on your community to, to, to learn faster if you can, but it's going to take time. And um, so, yeah, to me, it, it's a hard thing for me. It was one of the harder lessons to learn, actually, that patience will will, will prevail. It'll eventually pay off. Patience, um, and, and that means... You better obviously be consistent and try hard, but while you're doing that and you're being patient, you might as well make it fun. You might as well, you know, like, so you can work really hard, but you better enjoy it as well and allow yourself to have fun along the way. <laughs> I think you stole my, my last one. The third and last one is, is, yeah, if you don't make this fun, it's, it's, we joke about it. We're not paid. We're, we're, we're amateur athletes. We're not paid to compete. Right. I mean, we, when people ask us all the time, why do you do this? Why do you torture yourself? Why do you, why do you not drink on a Saturday night when we have a race the next day or whatever it is? Why do you, why do you do all this? And it's like, well, it, it's fun, but yeah, if it's not fun, then you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do all this stuff. Yeah. You, you gotta find, you gotta find your fun in it for sure. Even when it hurts. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. And, uh, appreciate you being on the show. Oh, and I appreciate being here. Oh, you know what? Before before we before we part ways, there is one more thing. You were talking about lessons learned. There, there's one more thing I think that's important is that is what I was talking about. It, I entered the sport like not knowing anything about swimming and running. And there's a lot of people out there that I think are intimidated by jumping into our sport because it looks really hard. Yeah, it looks like it's easy to fail. It it, it they don't have the experience. But my advice to them, one more lesson there is is. Just go for it. You you have to be willing to try and fail, you know, learn the lessons from it and grow and continue to blossom within those hard sports. Uh, to, to, to anybody thinking, I can't do that because you see people doing this hard thing, just try. My, my last gem is just give it a try. You, you'd be surprised what you can do when you allow yourself to, to, to get out of your comfort zone and do something new, for sure. It is a powerful message you know we do a, a, starting to do a lot of work with leadership teams and uh, and organizations and and as we come out and emerge from the seminars my takeaway is often take on a challenge and a, a lot of people it's normal mo most people struggle to do that because of the anxiety of failure and uh and, and actually taking it on and just I, I always like to say just jump off a cliff and flap your arms because you might just find out you can fly. And, uh, and if you can, you know what else, Matt, it ties back to community too, It because does. We're, you have a community. That's the net. You can jump off that cliff. We'll catch you. We will. Catch You're not going to fail catastrophically. 
we will catch you and you'll rebound from even the failure that comes from learning. I, I think so. And I think that sport is the safest venue to take the risk. It's not like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to, you know, like living in this city, so I'm going to move across the country. Well, that's a pretty big risk. Or I'm going to change careers. That's a pretty big risk. Sport is risk-free. So you, you can, it's a great venue. And, and when you lean into a community as well, as, as you've put it so nicely, it's the safety net. It's, it's the place that's going to facilitate success and ensure that you grow and learn. So it's a great one and, 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 and a great way to end the show. So Jeff, thank you for being on the show. That's what I said it, but also thank you for being a part of uh, purple patch, all of the support, the education, the guidance, the council, your, your title is the cruise director and it's well earned. We deeply appreciate it. And, um, and you're, you're such an integral part to the community that we've talked all about, to the team, and uh, and I'm proud of, of your own personal journey as well. So thanks once again. It was terrific fun, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate it too. It's an honor to be a part of this community. I, I encourage everyone to join us. Good man. Um, thanks, Pat, as always. All right. Cheers, yeah. Jeff. We're going to uh, introduce and welcome Purple Patch athlete, Marcel. Marcel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Matt. Taking your time out of your busy day, you get to have, well, I've got a nice cup of coffee with me. I hope you're loaded up there in uh, in Florida. But um, we want to talk about uh, uh, your journey a little bit. And, uh, and you're part of a, a series that we're doing, shining the spotlight on you guys that are down in the trenches doing the hard work. And I think your story has a lot of lessons that uh, listeners can draw from and apply to their own journey throughout the sport. And, um, and so if you're willing, we're just going to dig in and, um, and talk about your journey, some of the lessons, some of the training methodology, and, uh, and hopefully it will be uh, a little bit of fun. So what, why don't we kick off, as I like to do, with everybody, and, uh, and let's introduce yourself and, and go back all the way to the start. So, um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, living situation, growing up. Uh, who is Marcel Lopez? So as Matt said, my name is Marcel. Um, I'm 44 years old. I'm born and raised in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, currently living in Miami, uh, Florida. I moved here about 14 years ago now, coming up to 14 years. Uh, met my wife here, uh, so married, and I have a five-year-old boy. So you're uh, you you are the proverbial time-starved athlete in uh, in many ways. You're Pretty still, much still in the hurricane yeah. of it all. Yeah. Yes, yes, that is true. Now it's even getting uh, busier because now he's getting into, you know, little extracurricular activities and, like tennis, swimming, trying to trying to get him to to swim from a younger age maybe. It'll help him down the line. Well, we're going to dig into this. Stuff. We're going to dig into that <laughs> with you a little bit. We were just laughing about uh, uh your, your swimming expertise aligned with my running expertise, but we'll get there in a couple of moments. Uh, and and professionally, what do you what do you do? What's your background so, professionally? So, um I've been in the IT world for 24, 25 years now. Uh, uh doing from uh networking to currently IT security slash consulting. Uh, working at a local 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 firm here in down in Miami. Fantastic, and uh, let, let's let's go into sports. I always like to do this. I always have, like the background. Triathlon attracts a really broad range of people from a wide variety of athletic backgrounds. Uh, so, you growing up in San Juan, um, what was your sort of childhood like so far as sport? So, my first introduction to to sports basically was kind of track and field i put it into quotes because it was not not anything uh like official it was kind of like in the field days and in elementary school kind of like uh running yeah and running the shorter distances going fast or i thought i was going fast i don't know Um, (laughs) but but yeah i mean i kind of it woke up kind of like a competitiveness or showed my competitive uh, as, a, as, a, as a person i'm pretty much type a i would say so and then from there uh got into volleyball at the end of elementary school and going into high school and at the same time i was playing baseball which those two sports i mean can be anything further from endurance sports i dislike doing running running 
anything that had to do more than a mile. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that's pretty much my my background in sports. And um, so so and then here we are, many years later, talking about half Ironman, seventy point three racing, etc. So how how on earth did you find your way into triathlon? Uh, so it's funny uh, because uh, I already had started kind of uh, cycling again uh so i had i had my road bike and i was going out like weekend stuff not not nothing uh structured or anything it was just riding on the weekends and uh i saw that a, a former uh classmate of in high school he completed the 70.3 puerto rico and me being like the type a i'm like oh if he could do it I definitely can do this thing. So I, I started thinking I'm going to register to do 70.3 Puerto Rico without thinking that swimming, it was just jump in the water and just, yeah, it'll, it'll be easy. And that's when I realized I started training. I contacted a, a very good local coach, uh, uh, which learned a lot from him. Uh, a lot of the things that I know today are due to, thankfully I, I landed with a good coach. Um, so I went to my first pool session and I couldn't even get to the other side of the pool without feeling like I was drowning. And that's when it hit me that, nope, you're not doing a 70.3 anytime soon. So that's kind of where it started. <laughs> and now since then, you have completed a 70.3s also. You've, uh, you've done very well. You're still, still chasing the top 10 in your age group, you uh, you mentioned. So, but, um, but you've you've got now a solid background. So, so why don't you just give sort of a couple of your, your heady heights of accomplishments? Oh, well, so, I mean, I, I, I think the first year I, the first couple of years, I, I kind of stayed doing sprints because I wasn't really that confident in my swim. Uh, uh, but then as, as I, as I grew more confident again, I started delving into longer distances. Uh, did my first Olympic in Cleveland, which was one of the worst, uh, water conditions that everybody had seen in the nationals. That was my first DNS. I pretty much got in the water, like got panicked and I'm like, I'm not swimming out there. So I just turned around, gave my chip and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that was a little bit humbling. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, but then I did my first 70.3 in uh, 2019 Augusta. Uh, so that kind of did pretty good for my, being my first, um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that my biggest accomplishment to date was I wanted to go. One of my first targets was going on the five hours. So I, I was able to do that one um, in 2021 in North Carolina. Uh, current assisted. So I, I would say that some of that is thankful to the current. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, 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 it's been a pretty fulfilling uh, sport so far well i want i want to dig into that a little bit because um you're you know one, one thing that's very clear so far is the swim is your big weakness so you you know you've got a relatively robust background in cycling uh running is a relative strength etc was I, I i know the catalyst was seeing your buddy do the do the uh 70.3 in puerto rico i think i can do that too but now you've been into it I'm always interested because triathlon is an interesting sport in which almost everybody has a weakness. So swim is clearly yours. The run was mine. I came from a swimming background, so polar opposite of worlds. Is that now you're into the sport? Is that a part of the appeal in many ways that you're not just focusing on proving your strengths, but you're also sort of forced to back against the wall in order to be successful? You have to improve a weakness. Is, is that part of an appeal or, or do you just wish you were great at everything? I mean, I, I, I would say so. Absolutely. Um, like what, like you said, I mean, one of my current kind of goals is being able to qualify to, for a 70.3 world championship. So in a way, if I want to do that, I have to get better at swimming. There's no going around it. I cannot just go in the water and just take my time. So in a way it forces me to just keep working, keep, uh, improving as, as as much as possible um or at least getting my swim to a point that it's not a hindrance to the entire race 
so you know getting out of the water with enough energy that, then to attack the bike and the run legs so yeah, it's um it's uh it is one of those things that um if you think about the sport and in fact if you expand it to broader life there are there's very few occasions where we naturally really work on something that we are weak at and and i think that that's sort of really interesting not not just for your story but you're a great example of this if if you do go on and qualify for 70.3 worlds it would have been because of something that most people don't do which is to face a challenge in something that is quite daunting something that is clearly a weakness in which must be overcome and in many ways that's different than you know, imagine if I said I want to swim the English Channel. Let's just make it up. Well, I come from a swimming background, and all it really is is hard work in something that I'm strong at. But if I wanted to qualify to Boston or run the rim to rim in Colorado, whatever it might be, well, that's something that's a clear weakness. And so I do think that's something compelling about the sport for you. I, I want to dig into your mindset a little bit because we're going to we're going to log into your training a little bit. Uh, you mentioned to me prior to the conversation that quite often you were really hard on yourself. You've already mentioned you were type A. You said I was really almost judgmental on yourself around training. Can you can you just expand more of that? And and the, the real question is, how have you managed to evolve through that or overcome that? And how did sort of being a part of Purple Patch help that? Well, I mean, um, it's... So before, I would say a couple of years back, I would think that in order to get better at either swim, bike, run, either of the three disciplines, you really needed to, every single time you went to do a track session, 800s or 400s, whatever it was, and or intervals on the bike, VO2 max intervals, that you had to either hit your your target numbers or go above them. And if you didn't do that, then that would mean that okay, you're not improving. You're just either getting worse or getting weaker or your fitness is not increasing at the rate that it needs to, et cetera. So um, obviously as time has gone by, I I can go back and think of, I don't know, a bunch of sessions uh, that really didn't go as planned or as script uh, prescribed. But then I go to a race and I'm able to, either exceed or at least meet my expectations for that race. So now in hindsight, I can definitely say that that has nothing to do with how are you going to perform on any, any given day. It's just on that day, that's what you had and you just learn to deal with it and just, okay, you didn't hit whatever the numbers were, but you showed up, you trained. So it's just, uh, like it's money in the bank, I guess. Yeah. And I guess, um, you know, if you if you think about what it's called, it's called training or practice. Some people call it that. that that's really what it is. It isn't called judgment day. And uh, and I, th- I think that mindset is very, very common amongst athletes here yeah, where you're you're sort of every single day. We want to see validation. We want to see improvement. And um, and it's and, and it's in part because of your motivation, because of your drive, because of your commitment. So it's a really sort of natural, organic emotion to have. Um, how how has being a part of Purple Patch evolved? That is that um, is that something that maybe the community or the coaching or, or like how has it evolved your perspective, or is it just the the experience of as you've got wisdom in the sport? Do you think? I think it's a combination of everything. I would say. I mean, my my. Again, like I, like I mentioned, my previous coach, he one of the things he also kind of like liked to to uh, emphasize was learn how efforts feel. Like learn to to go by feel, not necessarily what a little uh, computer is telling you. Yeah, and that for me is super hard because I'm obsessed with numbers, <laughs> and I love data. And, and if I'm going doing out an interval and not seeing that number specifically there, it kind of drives me nuts a little bit. Now I just tend to ignore it for the most part. Um, and then the, obviously the purple patch methodology is kind of like the same, um, like going by efforts, knowing, understanding what your body is doing or feeling, how 
zone three, zone four, zone five feels. Um, the community as well, everybody kind of feeds into each other and, and, and results from everybody and the community kind of show that it's, it's, it's just about showing up. Um, and obviously, I mean, I, one of the reasons why I started working with, with, with John on one-to-one was to kind of get a little bit more specific feedback into what I'm doing and around my specific races. Yeah. So yeah. That's also helped. <laughs> you, you're, you're working with the right guy. You're, you're sort of something that's actually pretty common at Purple Patch. You, you are sort of both a squad member. So a slight, let's call it more autonomous program, uh, leaning into the team of coaches and the broader education and obviously the community to, to working directly with John, our swim expert. You're also got the benefit of having the guy for swimming helping you, giving you feedback on that. So and that's positive. I, I'm interested in your shift of um, training approach globally. And um, you, you mentioned one thing that I want to dig into a little bit, which is you said realizing or, or not approaching each week with every session being key and how to go easy. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, sure. So one of the biggest, I think, mistakes I did before understanding that piece was, especially running, I would not go easy run on, on easy days. I mean, I would have a long run and I wasn't going all out, but I was going too fast or too hard for sure. And, and, and it took me a while to understand that going easy doesn't mean that it's not going to, it's not going to make you slow. It's just going to, to, to do what it's meant to do, which is build your, your, your aerobic side. So um, it's an, and on the bike as well. Sometimes I would go out for two or three hours, four hours on the bike. I would come back and look at training peaks my normalized power was like 145 watts and I'm like, that's weak. <laughs> so, and, um, and appropriate, but that's not how it feels. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's just, it gives you that endurance of being able to then in a race ride hard for two hours, two and a half hours, and then have enough in the tank to then run well off the bike. So, it, it, it's just, I think it's just a matter of, it, it's years, it's experience, like everything you learn, um, you learn to trust the process, uh, learn to trust the, the, your coaches that what they're telling you is they're guiding you in the, in the, in the right direction. So what, what are some other sort of shifts in the overall approach that I think will be interesting for listeners? Um, I've got my magic list that you gave to me here, but I'd, I'd love for you to expand on that. So beyond going easy, not every session being key, there are a few things that you really have embraced over the last couple of years that have helped you, uh, particularly particularly in the fact that you you do have travel, you do have a lot of competing demands in life. But what are some of the specific sort of training uh, approaches that uh, that you've really evolved? So strength, that's been something that since joining Purple Patch, which was one of the reasons that I joined Purple Patch was that I, I knew that I needed to do something specific to the sport around strength. Um, so I've integrated strength a little bit like more into my program. It hasn't been easy. Uh, I think that I think that this year so far, it's finally the, 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 I can definitely say right now that it's consistent. Like last year I did the, at the beginning of the year, I did that 30 day thing that we did in January. Um, and I stuck to it, but then as the year progressed, I kind of dropped it. I, I didn't drop it a hundred percent, but it, it, it could have been better. So this year I'm, I'm making the effort to at, at, at a minimum, at least have one strength workout a week. Uh, so, so far it's, it's consistent. Um, another thing I, I wasn't doing consistently was uh, after every workout, having uh, a protein shake or some food with carbs and, and, and protein to kind of uh, get my body in that recovery mode. So that's, I think that that's uh, improved uh, how my consistency, how, how my training uh, progresses. I don't, and in terms of around travel, when I was traveling a lot, 
uh, I couldn't take my bite. So I kind of learned how to shift certain, okay, I can do swim, bite, I can do swim, run strength. So I would obviously on the days that I had a bite, I would swim or do strength training and learning how to move things around to um, at least uh, not just to do something, but something that would be with purpose productive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to to my to my training the uh the the post workout fueling i think is uh quite often people ask me in, in in interviews what's the number one thing and and you've just highlighted actually two of them that will be always my my number one and and i can't separate them which is to go easy in the easy workouts i think that's fundamental so that you can string together consistency most people that struggle, whether it's injuries, whether it's fatigue, whether it's lack of sort of return on investments or adaptations, it's typically going too hard in the easy stuff. That's, so that's always one that I highlight. The second is post-workout fueling. And if you can integrate that as, a, as, a, as an almost religion, you know, it's, uh, it's an absolute non-negotiable habit. It has such a positive knock-on effect in your consistency, your adaptations, your energy in the day. So I think those are great. And then just the last thing on strength training. It's really difficult for many people that are enthusiasts that love to, in this case, triathlon, swim, bike, and run, to really stick with strength throughout the course of the season. We're now recording this mid-March. Stay with it. Like, give yourself the experiment over the course of this year. And... Don't correlate it directly to faster, slower in your first race of the year, second race of the year, et cetera. Just go through the year and then pause, come back and say, okay, because it's, then it's a bona fide, genuine nine, 10 months that you've done it. So that's a habit. And just see how you feel functionally in life, as well as, of course, the objective side of the results. So I, I would say almost the three pillars of, of this is what I want to see around an athlete it, doing it really, really well, which is uh, is terrific. We also talked uh, a little bit about uh, a couple of things, walk breaks, I want to go there, and then on the bike, um, we, we have some pretty specific strength work that we do on the bike and terrain management. Now, you live in Florida, so can you let, why, don't, why don't we focus, we'll, we'll hold on the walk breaks for now, but why don't you talk about your bike training a little bit beyond the endurance stuff? Well, I mean, you just mentioned I live in Florida, which the highest mountains here are bridges. So, <laughs> yep. and, so and, and usually where I train on the weekends, it's, it's just flat. I, I actually avoid the bridge, not because I don't want to do it. It's just because it's safer not to have to do the bridge. Um, so it, it's challenging because I like, obviously when, when we do races, uh, for example, uh, Chattanooga, which I did last year, uh, St. George, uh, which I did in 2021, uh, Augusta, which I did in 2019, those were rolling slash hilly courses. So there's a lot of climbing and a lot of demand on knowing how to, knowing how to shift, knowing how to uh, purposely like, use your cadence and in, in, in order to, to maximize uh, your, your effort. Um, and as, as well as descending, which I've kind of been a little bit more comfortable now, be, not because of any specific training that I'm doing, it's just, again, experience. Uh, I feel a lot more comfortable. My bike that I have right now has disc brakes, so it helps knowing that your brakes are not just going to heat up and not work at the end of a, of a descent. Um, but in terms of climbing, uh, I do most of my bike training indoors, uh, two sessions indoors. And, you know, I try to go out at least once, uh, for my long rides. And, and before I wasn't really doing anything well before when I joined purple patch, we, we still did strength endurance stuff on the bike. I did it on Swift, but there was not that focus and and learning on how to use your bike and your body to attack those uh, uh inclines and that's one one thing that since starting the, the the velocity platform it's kind of been game changing in terms of learning how to use gears how to use cadence in order to maximize your your speed return and then one of the funny things is that every single race that I've done on a hilly course, I am passing so many people <laughs> uh, on the downhill. 
that it's crazy. Like, because a lot of people like, like, like we see, they reach the, the, the top of the hill and they just relax. Yeah. Instead of gaining speed and then relaxing on the downhill, which you, you really, you're not going to go that much faster. So learning those little details, it's just free speed, free time that you're getting uh, with very little effort in, in, in a way. Yeah, well, it, what it is, it's, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of the term free speed, but there, there is sort of, because I think it's well earned and, uh, and your input over there. I'll say, and I'm, it's just slightly tangential, but, you know, when, when we decided to transition to the platform and uh, I did it, I, I, you know, made this decision to, to go to the Velocity platform because I, I realized that it was a really effective coaching tool. And I had the hypothesis at the time that it would help people become better bike riders. I am even frankly quite surprised at how impactful it has been, number one, and how realistic it is. Because, you know, and, and for people, listeners that have not been on the platform, our ability to basically create any sort of terrain and for the bike and the trainer to interact in a way that is directly real world. So how you carry speed, how you can build speed. As a coach, it, it, it's really, really interesting. And just last week, we were doing some terrain management side of stuff. And as everybody sort of, you know, synthetically, hypothetically, or proverbially crested the hill, I deliberately didn't say anything. And I had the whole of Studio One in San Francisco, everybody at home, keenly looking at their leg speed and saw them all accelerating. And I was like, that is behavior that you want. It's now ingrained in this is how I do it. So even you in the in the desperate flatlands of Miami, uh, as sort of actually from home, genuinely able to do it. And there really isn't another platform like it. It's very, very special, I think. So we get to benefit from it, which is a great thing. Go ahead. Yeah, and to add that, uh, also in North Carolina last year, it was very windy. Mm. So pretty much on the way out, I would say 25, 30 miles, we were against a headwind. And I think that we've we've done certain sessions, which is, uh, I think it's called heads and tails. Yes. Which is one once, uh, I don't know, three, four minutes is simulating a headwind, and then the other one simulating a tailwind. And even here, that is something that I can practice because there's a lot of headwind. Yep. I mean, on most of my rides, I would say 50 to 53% of it, it's like it's a headwind. And, and knowing how to use my bike to assist me in, in getting quicker through it, it's, 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 it's been, it's a, it's a game, it, it's a game changer, literally. I mean, it I, is. And I've, I've done more. Yeah. And, and sorry, I'm over, I'm overriding cause I'm, I'm coaching a little bit, but, um, the, it is the, like what you're highlighting here. And, and I think this is it set one of the central reasons I wanted to have you on the show is that you are, IT guy, very metrics based, very numbers based. And what you've actually developed over the last couple of years is a toolkit that it's not just, you think about how we started, very harsh on yourself, every session needs to be good, otherwise it's a failure. And evolving to actually say, you know what, I'm, it's not just practice is practice, logging the time, doing the sessions to the best of your ability on the day. But in addition to that, I'm actually building a toolkit that you got real world application, which is uh, you deserve a, a lot of kudos for that. Um, I know I know we're stacked up against time here, so um, I want to come just to sort of the results a little bit and um, the impact of this. Uh, you're you obviously become much better from an organisational effectiveness standpoint. Integrating strength training, post workout fueling was really important. We didn't get to dig into sleep, but I know that's been a, a big catalyst for you and then the whole mindset around training i'm interested in what the outcome has been for you if we're sort of treating this as a little bit of a case study a lot's changed and evolved in your training your habits your mindset and that i think that's really central so what's the impacts in in your words i mean i can use two races as good examples of how i've been able to apply Pretty much a lot of the, the the things and the lessons that and the education that we we get uh from, from purple patch um in 2000 what was it 22 i did 70.3 puerto rico so the wednesday leading up to that week i was traveling on thursday that wednesday i was setting my 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 wheels 
and one of them just literally blew up my ribs at 9 p.m. I had no spare, so I had to. I thankfully I, I had a friend as a mechanic. He sent me, he lent me a pair of wheels. But I got to Puerto Rico. That was those are not my my race wheels. I'm not used to them. The, the cassette it wasn't compatible necessarily with my my the gears I had on my bike. So I had to do the entire race on four gears, and I could have just thrown the towel, which I I thought about it when I got back uh, into T2 before going out of the run because I had no run legs. I knew that that run was going to be horrible, but you know. And it, it, I, I couldn't do it just because I didn't want to let myself down and, you know, and, and because I, I had to try. So I went out, I finished the run, even though it wasn't pretty, but I finished it. And then the second was that same year in North Carolina during the swim, my watch got ripped. So I pretty much did the entire race with nothing, no metrics. I had to go by feel and that technically was it's been it's my 70.3 distance pr so oh, there you go i and and that was totally by feel and the lesson from for me there was that sometimes i'm so focused on heart rate or power or whatever that i hold myself back even though i my body still has more to give and being blind i think that allowed me to push a little bit more because I had I didn't know what my heart rate was I didn't know what the power was so and it, it was it was again it's eye, eye opening you let the body do its thing uh, yep pretty much how how about how about how about broader life you we started the the conversation with you're very busy time starved what, what what's uh, what's the impact been on your life globally I mean I think it's the organizational skills are easier in terms of being able to organ uh, make sure that I train and then I have time to then either go to barbecue at a friend's house in the afternoon or moving training around so that I can go to my kids swim class. So stuff like that. Um, also, and it's, it's funny because my wife always tells me all the time, like she doesn't understand how, why, how can I do it? How I have so much energy. And I think that part of, the sport, uh, the sport has given me a lot more energy to do all the other things around, uh, around work and around training. And to an extent, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's an outlet. Uh, so it, in terms of energy, I would, I wouldn't say energy, but, uh, it, it mellows me, calms me down. So I'm not so reactive. Uh, so I can, think things through a little bit better before doing something. So if you wanted, uh, if you had one chance to impart a lesson or two to the listeners, uh, what would it be as it applies to sport or life? Um, be patient. I think um, if it, it, endurance sports is not something that you're going to get, it's not a, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's very difficult. And if you really, want to not only be good at it but stay healthy and, and and enjoy it i think that being patient is one of the most important things because that way you you don't try to do too much uh at any given time and then you know, you know injuries or whatever it is that yeah uh, gets you out of of your routine Fantastic. Well, Marcel, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining the show. I really appreciate it. And also, thank you for being a part of Purple Patch. Thanks so much for putting your, your trust in us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Matt. All right. Cheers. Guys, thanks so much for joining and thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the new format. You can never miss an episode by simply subscribing. Head to the Purple Patch channel of YouTube and you will find it there and you could subscribe. Of course, I'd like to ask you if you will subscribe, also share it with your friends and it's really helpful if you leave a nice positive review in the comments. Now, any questions that you have, let me know, feel free to add a comment and I will try my best to respond and support you on your performance journey. And in fact, as we commence this video podcast experience, if you have any feedback at all, as mentioned earlier in the show, we would love your help 
in helping us to improve. Simply email us at info at purplepatchfitness.com or leave it in the comments of the show at the Purple Patch page and we will get you dialed in. We'd love constructive feedback. We are in a growth mindset, as we like to call it. And so feel free to share with your friends. But as I said, let's build this together. Let's make it something special. It's really fun. We're really trying hard to make it a special experience. And we want to welcome you into the Purple Patch community. With that, I hope you have a great week. Stay healthy. Have fun. Keep smiling, doing whatever you do. Take care.